Good morning. If you're happier to be here in the house of the Lord this morning than the best hospital in town, say amen. 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 There's enough bad news. There's enough depressing news. There's enough discouraging news to go around. And so I'm glad that you're here today. I hope that you will find a great word of encouragement today as we open up God's word and that he ministers to us through the power of his Holy Spirit today here at Lake Forest Baptist Church. If you're a guest with us, again, thank you for being here today. It's good to see you, familiar faces from some time ago, and new faces as well. So it's good to see each of you here today in the house of the Lord. Some have been away for a while, and we know that we have in an estimate of 15 to 20 people that because of COVID aren't here today. And so keep those p folks in your prayers during the week. Um, isolationism is a very difficult thing to deal with. You know, that's a torture technique in, you know, uh, in war is to isolate people. And God said in the beginning, it's not good for man to be alone. And I believe he meant man and woman to be alone. And so we have a lot of folks that are by themselves because of the precautions that they've chosen to isolate themselves. There's some that have no choice, like Mr. Merritt, that his facility is in lockdown. And so to speak a word of encouragement to them through a card or a letter or a note, an email, a text, a phone call uh, as you go about your business during the week. Think about those folks that can't be here, that are prevented from being here today. and Reach out to them with the love of Jesus Christ. We continue our message entitled, Lord Help Me, I'm Doing Again, with part three. Hopefully today this will be the end of this message. Hopefully uh, you will find a, a great encouragement by the practical steps that we all can endeavor to take and utilize in our life when it comes to dealing with uh, this thing that we call sin, which is nothing less than, nothing more than disobedience against God, what his will might be for us in occasion or in a life that we experience in a day-to-day basis. I hope that uh, by this time that you have understood that our series entitled Courageous Christianity it, it speaks to the idea that Charles Stanley expresses when he said this word and this phrase many times, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. You know, it, it takes a courageous Christian to obey God in these days, doesn't it? I mean, you can certainly be pointed out, fingered, and numbered uh, in various different ways, media can do that, uh, workplace can do that, and so if you're going to obey God and leave all the consequences to him, you definitely need to have a close relationship with the person of Jesus Christ and the empowerment that comes through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so I hope that you understand that the whole a sermon title here is to help us to understand what can prevent us from leading a courageous Christian life, in other words, from being fully obedient to God to Christ and through the leading of the Holy Spirit and how to cope with that in your day-to-day -day life. Now, last week we began the, with three of the eight uh, principles that uh, John MacArthur laid out. Just briefly, I want to recap those before we continue on in our reading of the scripture and then the remaining five. The first one we said was never underestimate the seriousness of sin. Never underestimate the seriousness of sin. And as I was thinking about this, MacArthur says a lot of great things in, in his sermon and, and whatnot and his commentaries about this. However, I want to bring something a little bit different than what he said out. We talked about the seriousness of sin in, in many different ways. I think sometimes that myself and I think pro perhaps you think that sins are serious based on the effect that they have. Meaning, you know, to murder is one thing, right? To tell a lie is a whole lot less serious, right? That's not so. Not in God's economy at all. Jesus said, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. And if that is true, if that's the case, he's highlighting not the differential between sin, but the seriousness of sin. How God sees sin in the economy of God. And so we need not look at the effect of sin, whether it be on ourselves personally or on our spouses or our friends or our family, our church family. And think about this, even the unsaved. We need not even be concerned primarily with them, but number one, the seriousness of sin directly impacts God. Directly impacts God. 
Let me illustrate. For example, many of us would consider, you know, a parking ticket as not being very serious violation of the law. But on the other hand, if you got 300 parking tickets in a year, that would be a whole different matter, right? Uh, how about this? You would think that, you know, having a disparaging or derogatory word against the President of the United States would be somewhat serious. But you make a threat against the life of the person who is the President of the United States, and you might end up getting a visit from the FBI or the Secret Service, which would be a whole different matter, right? Now let's take this a little further down the road in, in consequences and seriousness of sin. You go to Iran and live as a citizen of Iran, or even as a guest of Iran, and you speak a derogatory word uh, against their supreme leader, Ayatollah Sayed Ali Khomeini. And you're not going to get a visit from the police. You're not going to get a visit, you know, from the local beat cop. You're going to get a visit with somebody that's going to have a sword in your hand, and you're going to die. That's a level of seriousness that we, you and I, need to take about our sin because, like, uh, like <clears throat> it was uh, David who said, against you and you only have I sinned. He said that in Psalm 51. See, David understood what you and I need to understand, that all sin is ultimately an offense to God. And because God is an eternal God, that offense has the potential to eternally offend an eternal God. Joseph said something similar. You remember when Mrs. Potiphar tried to seduce him. And he said this in Genesis. He says, how can I do this evil thing and sin against God? You see, Joseph knew that adultery was wrong just in the context of where he was at. Keep in mind, this was before the Ten Commandments, okay? But he intuitively knew that this was wrong, but he directed that sin against God. He says, how can I do this evil thing and sin against God? He notice he didn't even bring Potiphar into the question. He went right to the top. And so sin is serious and it's very serious to God, and therefore we should take sin seriously. Number two, we said never t think too highly of your spirituality. Never think that you're way up here, that you've progressed in the maturity of your spirituality to the point that you are without temptation, that you are above temptation. Uh, that's why uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He says, take heed lest you fall. The full verse says, it says, therefore let him who thinks he stands, meaning stands firm as, as, a, as a pillar, as a structural member of a building, and stands firm to hold things up, to take care of things. It says, take heed lest you fall. You know, there's a biblical character that illustrates this very good. You remember the fellow named Samson? The, the day that he, he came, he succumbed to all of his pride. He got up and he says, I will get up. I will go out as I have in times past. And the Bible says, and he didn't even know that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Take heed lest you fall. Don't ever overestimate your spirituality. I would say it would be better to underestimate your spiritual maturity and overestimate your dependency on God than anything else. And number three, we said strongly purpose and promise God not to sin. Strongly promise and purpose not God not to sin. MacArthur said this, it's a great difference between sin dwelling in us and sin being entertained by us. Great difference between sin remaining and sin being harbored. And so when we don't lay aside, when we don't make an effort, when we don't say, Lord, I need your help and I want to promise you, like the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 106, I like the New Living Translation which says it like this, is, I have promised once and I'll promise it again to obey your righteous judgments. See, that's a God-honoring disposition that even though it might seem to be a little arrogant on our part by saying something so from, I promised it once and I'll promise it again. I'm going to do what you say, Lord. I think that's something that God will honor. He sees the intent of our heart and the motive behind it. And if it's a just and a motive behind that, he'll honor that and he'll enable you to do that. My friend and mentor, Dr. Bill Bennett, used to say it like this, make an advanced decision. I, and rather than saying, make a decision in advance, he would say, make an advanced 
decision. Number one, he would say, plan ahead. Plan ahead not to sin. That's what he's saying. And if we're not going to sin, then we're planning to do something opposite to sin. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might, sin, might not sin against you. Psalm 119.11. So that's the first three that we recap very briefly. Now let us continue on with our message uh, beginning with premise number four, principle number four. But first, turn your eyes to the word of God in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So with your copy of God's word, let us turn our eyes to his word, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And when I hear the smartphone pages stop flipping, and I'll know you're there. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. That, that's, that's the stuff that we're talking about right now. And the sin that so easily entangles us. He says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us pray. Lord, we need your help today. Lord, to make a right assessment of not only where we stand before you in relationship, but also, Lord, uh, where we've gone astray in our thinking, Lord, and in our living, Lord. Uh, the things that might not necessarily be sin, but lead us into sin. Uh, Lord, I remember that when you taught the disciples to pray, you said you, that they wanted to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would, before the temptation would even come, Lord, that you would help us to see uh, where we are in regard to specific things, Lord, that, that might try to ensnare us and entangle us, Lord, that you would give us clear vision, Lord, to see these things. And, Lord, wisdom, Lord, to take steps, Lord, practical steps in concert and alongside the Holy Spirit, the power, the present, and the person of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that we, Lord, would not succumb to the wiles of the evil one, that we would be able to extinguish the fiery darts, Lord, and, Lord, that we would be able, through your power and your strength, through your mercy, Lord, not only to, to avoid, but, Lord, to thrive above and rise above these things which would so easily entangle us and encumber us. We pray and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue today with the fourth principle that MacArthur spoke of, and it's this principle here in very short words. Resist sin immediately. Resist sin immediately. Number four, resist sin immediately. MacArthur says, don't try to stop sinning. Stop sinning before it starts. See, there's a, a big difference between stopping something once it's already in motion and stopping it before it even begins to get motion. You know, it's like uh, in physics class, they tell you that this ball hanging here, over here on this string, has potential energy. But it's not until it moves that it actually displays energy and can transfer energy into some other object. Better to, you know, not be around this ball as it's moving back and forth. That you wouldn't receive its energy upside the head, so to speak. And so that's the difference between kinetic and, and potential energy. I, the, James really said it in a different way here, but he used the metaphor of a pregnancy to help us to understand that. He said this in verse 14 of James chapter 1. He said, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Listen to this. It says, then when lust has conceived, there's your pregnancy metaphor here. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished or when it brings itself to its end, guess what? It brings forth death. You see, that's what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. And you don't see this in the text, but from... from Great research and looking at the word structure of the, what's going on in the garden there and the temptation. It's as if Adam is standing at a distance listening to what's going on while Eve is being tempted. You see, it, the evil one said that as soon as you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God knows that you will be like him. And while it's admirable to know the difference between good and evil, which was what was being sold... 
The same thing, the other thing, is that you will be like God once you eat of this is another appealing thing. You see, it went to the eyes. It said it was appeared good to the vision, to our eyes, and then it, in our mind, we go back to uh, 1 John, and it says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all of those were there in the temptation. And better that Eve should have turned and run, kind of like Joseph. You know, he turned tail and run. Better that she should have run than to even listen. Remember that Jesus, when he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness, didn't argue with Satan. He made matter-of-fact statements three times in a row that we have recorded for us. It says, thus saith the word, thus saith the Lord. See, he didn't do battle with him. Remember that in Daniel, when we studied Daniel, and the prophecy that, that come about the end times in Daniel, that there was an angel sent to Daniel, but that angel was delayed by the evil angels, the demons. He was delayed in one-on-one -on -one combat, but it wasn't until the archangel came and relieved him of the battle that he was able to go to Daniel and deliver the encouraging message. So even, even though we don't see these things, understand clearly that stopping sin before it starts is far easier and far better than allowing it to germinate and bring forth even the smallest little fruit. Charles Stanley told this story of his early life and childhood. He said when he grew up in a small town, it was not uncommon for them to go out on the evenings. And one evening, he was with the boys and the boys were some of the boys, most of the boys, that went to church with him. And one of the boys suggested that they go to the pool hall. Back then, the pool hall was that place that good people didn't go. But the pool hall was the place that you might be able to get a little beer. And after everybody had decided that that's where, the, where they were going to go that night, Charles says, no, I can't go. And, of course, you know what happens in peer pressure and things like that. Charles says, no, I'm going home. And he said he walked down the streets, and he says, in the story, he says, I remember the exact house, and he names the person that lived in the house. When I walked by this house, it was as if God said to me, Charles, you will never regret this decision. And that's how it is with sin. When we, when we uh, Joanne, this is for you, nip it in the bud. When we nip it in the bud and we take care of it right there at, at the point to where it could be conceived. And remember, that's in our minds most of the time. We're doing battles in our minds. And when we nip it in the bud, then it has no traction. It, it builds no stronghold, no foothold, no toehold. And that's where we need to do it. Then we need to resist sin immediately. Now, James just used this analogy of this uh, uh, picture, this metaphor of pregnancy, but he goes on later in James 4, 7, and he says, here's, here's what we ought to do. Rather than play with the idea of sin, let it ruminate in our minds, he says, submit to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's exactly what Jesus did in the temptation, he submitted to God. He submitted himself. He said, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go his way, my father's way. And that's what we need to understand. That's the right way. That's the efficient way. And that's the less painful way is to submit to God. No matter what happens, obey God and leave the consequences to him. Another again. You know, that was said by Charles Stanley's grandfather, who was a pastor. George Washington Stanley is his name. And that's where Charles first heard that. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. I think that's something that we need to write on the fly leaf of our Bible like, like Spurgeon had written on his. This Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this Bible. So number four, resist sin immediately. Don't toy with it. Don't entertain it. Dismiss it. Count on the word of God. Use the word of God. Dismiss it. Number five, meditate on the Word of God. So speaking about the Word of God, the psalmist in Psalm 37, uh, 31 says, The law of his God is in his heart. His steps will not slip. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps will not slip. Now, d before you go down the, the road of legalism here, that's not what this is saying. That's not saying that you have to have 
you know, 613 rules in order to keep, you know, within the boundary uh, of the lane that you ought to be in driving down the road of life. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is what you fill your heart with will guide your steps in life. I can't remember whether it's uh, uh, Proverbs 427 or 423. 423, it says, guard your hearts with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life, the writer in Proverbs says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Not ourselves. Trust the Lord. What do we know about the Lord that doesn't come from the Bible primarily? Yeah, we have a subjective, personal, individual experience with the Lord. But objectively, this is about as concrete as it can get. The Word of God. And so we need to meditate on the Word of God in order to know what pleases God, that it would, it, it, that it would fill us. And when, when the Hebrews used the word heart, they meant the totality of your person. They're not talking about this beating instrument here. They're not talking about just merely the mind, but they're talking about the totality of what it means to be a human being made in the image of God. So that's your emotions, that's your mind, that's your will, that's all of these things. And so when our heart is filled with the Word of God, it will be controlled with the Word of God. Like later, it says in Ephesians 5, 18, I believe it is, it says, <laughs> you know, don't be drunk with wine in which is excess or dissipation, but be filled. That means controlled in the Greek there. But be filled with another spirit, not the spirit of alcohol, but the spirit of the Lord. And so when we talk about the Word of God, it's easy to say that the Bible is replete with example after example after example. For example, I've already said, you know, how can a young man cleanse his way? By keeping it according to his word. Psalm 119.9. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.11. And so when we have these, these things that are internal to us, not external to us, how much more readily available are they in the occasions of life when we come up against sin? when we come up in the face of temptation. You know, I've heard people say so many times, I just couldn't resist it. And I say, Do you, are you familiar with 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13? There is no temptation which is overtaking you, overtaking you but that which is common to man. But the God, the Lord, will with the temptation make a way of escape so you might be able to endure, persevere, through it. And so God's word is so important. The late Adrian Rogers told a story about the necessity of the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. But I want to adapt it just a little bit slightly here for the word of God. And Rogers said, imagine that you, you, you know a man that just bought his first automobile, his first car. He's so proud of it. He invites friends and neighbors over to look at it, to show off the car. The lacquer, it looks like it's a, a foot deep. The tires are all nice and shiny, and the upholstery is all smooth, and all these things. And he says it's a wonderful thing. This car is a wonderful thing. But this owner doesn't know about automobiles, so he pushes it everywhere around town that he goes. He pushes this car. Now you say, and this is what Roger said, now, Pastor Rogers, you know that's ridiculous. That, that's absolutely correct. It is ridiculous. It's ridiculous unless you, you understand something that he doesn't, that that car has an engine, and if you put the key in and you turn the ignition and you step on the accelerator, that engine will fire to life. You see, a believer has the energy to live this life as God would will them to live. But there's something that we must do to cooperate with that. We fill up the tank, right? What do we fill up the tank with? MTV, uh, HBO, uh, you know, CNN. No, we fill up the tank with the Word of God. Unless you put the right fuel in the automobile, you're not going to get anything out. I was a small boy growing up right across the river here. And when I was a small boy, my parents had me mow the grass, push mower, right? And I decided one day I was going to help my neighbor be neighborly, which was very uncommon. And I go over, and I pull on his lawnmower, and it don't start. So I said, well, it's out of fuel. 
I go get the garden hose, and I fill that tank up, and I pull, 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 and and guess what? That lawnmower never did start. You see, you put the right thing in, you get the right thing out. You put the wrong thing in, and you don't get it. I'm I'm telling you that if your heart is filled with the Word of God, you will have an automatic, instantaneous, calibrated compass pointing straight north and true all the time. Now, whether you listen to it or not, I can't say. But you'll have a calibrated compass. You'll know what is right and true. And the Holy Spirit will use every bit of that stuff that you store up when you meditate. Because to meditate means also that you memorized it. You can't meditate on something you don't know. And so when you put that in the tank, you give the engine uh, an essential element to do its operation in your spiritual life. Don't ever underestimate the necessity of meditating on the Word of God. With all of my heart I sought you. Do not let me wander from your ways or your commandments. Your Word have I treasured or hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verses 8 and, or 9 and, excuse me, 10 and 11 of Psalm 119. Number 6. Now this one I've changed the whole name completely from what MacArthur said because my mentor had this phrase and it just sticks like glue with me. Instant repentance and cleansing from all sin. Instant repentance and cleansing from all sin. There's a gauge that we can use here to help illustrate something. You can gauge where you're at in your walk of spiritual maturity, being conformed to the image of Christ by this thing right here. How long it takes from the moment of sin until you confess, repent, and are cleansed of sin. The immature will not likely see the sin, will be less likely to admit the sin, and a whole less likely, a lot likely, less likely to confess, to repent, and ask forgiveness of that sin. But the mature, they're the first ones that leave. Let me give you an illustration. Remember when Jesus was in the temple and they brought the lady that was there accused of adultery? They actually caught her in the process. They said, we've caught her in the process. We've seen it with our own eyes. He says, what do you say, Jesus, that we should do? And he stoops down and he starts doodling on the ground a little bit. He stands back up to teach, and he says, let let he or him who is without sin cast the first stone. Then he stoops back down. He doodles a little bit more. He stands back up, and guess what? The Bible says that they were alone, he and her. But notice that the Bible also says in that, that beginning with the oldest to the youngest they left. Do you see that? I don't think that is just merely a a reference to age, physical age, but I think that's maturity. There's there's something about growing in your maturity with Jesus Christ, with having a little bit of water under the bridge. You've canoed a few miles up and down the stream. That kind of tempers us, isn't there? You know, uh, those of you who have been here for 10 and 20 25 years, you know the differences that myself exhibit today. Now, there was a time then it was black and white, it was simple, and buddy, if you didn't toe the line, that was it. Leanne's laughing down here at the front row. She was in a Sunday school class subjective with my torture for a number of years. I'm not saying compromise, but what I'm saying is, is that The Lord has given me the ability to see the mercy and grace that he himself has bestowed upon myself and others and us as a community of human beings made in his image. And that makes a difference. But let me tell you, we must, we must, we must repent and be cleansed of our sin. 
There is nothing. And, and it begins with the attitude that begins with maturity. Like Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he said uh, this in Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are those who mourn. What are they mourning over? Blessed are they who mourn. Is it mourning over the government, the taxes, you know, death is imminent? No, he's talking about spiritual things there. What are they mourning about? Our disposition, our sinfulness, our, our tendencies. And he goes on in the verse before that, he says, not only are they mournful, but they're poor in spirit. I don't have a high estimation of myself as I might have, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. I don't rate myself as highly as I did. And that's because I'm closer to the light and I see the difference between he and me. I know that, like Dr. Bennett said, there's lots of room for improvement here. There's lots of room for improvement here. And trust me, it does make me mourn, even though you might not see it, even though my wife might not see it. It does make me mournful. It does make me poor in spirit to, to know that I, I keep doing the same stuff over and over again. But thank God, we have a God, it says, who was tempted in all ways like us, yet he did not sin, right? And that he's seated, as, as the scripture told us today, he's seated, but his work's not done just because he's seated. He's there interceding on our behalf. Therefore, let us come to the throne of grace with boldness, Hebrews says earlier, because he does understand, he can, he can help uh, uh, in a time of need, and he does help. In the time of need. Instant repentance and cleansing from all sin. Number seven, continual prayer. Continual prayer. I want to say something about prayer. Apart from anything and everything that you do or can do or might do as an individual for the kingdom of God, prayer is more important. Prayer is more important. I'd rather have a church of five people that prayed very, very, very diligently than a church of 5,000 that worked as if tomorrow was the last day. There is just something about the power of prayer that can help get you to the right place at the right time to do exactly what God wants you to do. If you're not praying about what we're doing as we live our lives as individuals, as a church. If we're not praying as a church about what the mission and the goals are in this church, we're just asking God, in, a, in other words, when we pray, bless what we're thinking about doing. And that's not right. But we need to be in a continual, uh, regarding sin and sin that so easily entangles us, we need to be in a constant state of prayer. Paul wrote the Thessalonians in verse Five, chapter 5, verse 17 of First Thessalonians, he said, pray always. Pray always. He, he went on to write the Ephesians, and he says, pray in always with all prayer and supplication. In Ephesians 5, 18. And this is, you know, when we talk about doing battle against the evil one and sin, even after the armor of God is explained to the believers there, and it apparently looks like there's only one offensive weapon, the sword of the word. He says, pray, but pray, but pray. He's saying, pray, because that is an offensive weapon. Because when we talk to God, he listens. The scripture tells us that if we know that he hears, he'll give us the petitions of our heart. Why? Because we've meditated on his word. We know who he is. We know the object of his eye. Uh, he, know, he knows that we know that we're on the same page, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Because you're in communion, fellowship. You're on the same page. Jesus thought it was important to pray. And if Jesus thought it was important to pray, should I dare say that we ought to pray? Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, that men ought always to pray. If for no other reason than this, listen, he says, men ought to always pray and not lose heart. If you're discouraged, don't let that keep you from prayer, but run to prayer even more quickly. That you not lose heart. That you not lose heart. And remember a few weeks ago we were talking about Peter and the guys in the Garden of Gethsemane. He took his intimate inner three and he drug, drug them over here a little bit further. And he said, you know, y'all stand right here and y'all pray. Watch that you not enter into temptation. 
What was Jesus doing? He was praying. My favorite verse about prayer when it comes to Jesus, Mark 135, long before the light, he got up, went to a solitary place, went to a solitary place, and there he prayed, long before light. Jesus thought it was important to pray, and friends, it is important to pray, because when we pray, we're enlisting the hosts of heaven. We're enlisting the aid of the host of heaven to come to us to help us in the moment of our need. Uh, MacArthur said it like this, don't fight the enemy on your own. When you engage the enemy, pray, plead for help. He says, and remember, praying in an anticipatory manner is very effective. Before you even get to the battle, pray. Before the temptation comes, pray. When you get up in the morning, then pray that you would not enter into temptation, that the evil one would be prevented from coming to you. Pray. Pray. That's exactly why he said, Lord, do not let us enter into temptation in the model prayer that Jesus gave the disciples. And the eighth thing, number eight, covenant company. I changed this a little bit. Covenant company. We don't think too much of the word covenant anymore. A covenant can be summarized really in a synonym of promise. A promise. When, when you make a covenant with someone, it's like saying, I'm going to be here at 8 p.m., Leanne. You, you made a promise. But that's also like a covenant. But a covenant in the Old Testament was a much more serious thing because one of the first covenants that we have illustrated was, was that an animal was separated and the blood was let. And it says, if I break this covenant, let the same thing be done to me that happened to this animal. You see, it's serious. But what we need is we need covenant company. What we need is an accountability partner. Now, all of you are probably cringing right now. You're thinking about all the ways that this can go bad. You know, somebody's in my business. They, they know too much. They're taught too much. You know, they're going to tell somebody else and all this. Put all of that aside and trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. It, 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 when it comes to covenant company, think about it like this. Paul wrote Galatians chapter 6, and then there's a great admonition to us. He said, bear one another's burdens, says Paul in verse 2 of chapter 6. Bear one another's burdens. See, that's what a covenant company does for you, is help you to bear up in time of need. But also, there's another side of that. It says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, Christ wants us to be in communion with one another. Not only communion with him, and the person of the Holy Spirit, but with one another, brothers and sisters of like mind. And we're supposed to show preference toward one another. To, and that word preference doesn't mean to distinguish one as not being worthy as opposed to one being worthy. It means we're supposed to give special attention one to another as believers. We're brothers and sisters. And so we should have care for one another. He goes on and says in verse 1, he says, if one of you is caught in a trespass sin or a fall, however you want to put it, you who are spiritual, you go to them and do what? Beat them up? Nope. Castigate them? Nope. Make them feel bad? Nope. He says, restore such one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself, watching yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, begins verse 2. We need covenant company. The book of Ecclesiastes gives us a great illustration of what I'm talking about here. Rather than somebody that's going to be a busybody in your life, this is what we're looking at an accountability partner. Verse 9 of chapter 4 says this. It says, Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. Verse 10 goes on and says, For if either of them falls, one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls, and there is not another to lift him up. Verse 11 goes on and says, Therefore, if two lie down, they keep warm. Don't take that out of context. But how can one be warm alone? And then verse 12 says, If one can overpower him, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a covenant partner a covenant relationship, an accountability partner, accountability relationship. We're talking about somebody that cares enough for you to be able to speak truth in your life, but it's also going to love you in spite of what you're doing many times and try to help you out. 
I always said that, you know, people say all the time that that's a good friend, you know, it'll come get you out of jail. The best friend will be in jail with you. That's a covenant community. It's somebody that's going to be there in a difficult time. Now, just to recap, we said that it's important, number one, to never underestimate the seriousness of sin. Number two, never think highly of your spirituality. Number three, strongly purpose and promise God not to sin. Number four, to resist sin immediately. Number five, meditate on the word. Number six, instant repentance and cleansing from all sin. Number seven, continual prayer. Number eight, a covenant company. To have a covenant company. I want to encourage you to think about the importance of these things. The necessity. I, I'm, I'm saying these are necessary things that will help you endure the temptation. And not only just endure, to overcome many of the temptations that come to you. On a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. We need a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. But there's just something about looking a person eye to eye that will take the time to sit down with you and listen. Not to criticize, but to encourage. And sometimes that encouragement might be a little bit more like exhortation. You know, encouragement is, that's okay, I'm here with you. And, you know, exhortation is like, get back in there. You know, you know better than that. And so be encouraged that we do have the person of the Holy Spirit, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. But remember, we have to cooperate. That verb that's there that talks about laying aside, it's not the Holy Spirit doing this for us. It requires our cooperation, our willingness, our decision-making in order to, to gain this. And to make a plan in advance is very wise in this regard. Collegia used to jump out of perfectly good aircraft, which he told me today. None, no aircraft is perfectly good. There was a plan, and when I, when I, uh, when I studied this stuff uh, when I was early in my military career, they always said, you know, before you left ground, if, it's, if we don't get above 800 feet, you know, you got to ride the plane down. They see what they were doing there, had a plan in advance. What if something went wrong? You ride it down under 800 feet. Above, you can jump out. Of course, we had parachutes on, okay? But make a plan in advance is what they were saying. So today, as our times come to close once again, I hope that uh, you can listen and you can see the value of these very practical steps that will help you to overcome the sin that might so easily entangle you in life and be able to to, to utilize the, the resources that God has given you, a, a, a mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind that you will use that mind. That's where the warfare or the battle of sin really begins is in the mind. And that you'll use the mind, that you'll make an advanced decision to, you know, to, to enact some proactive measures in your life that you would not succumb to the temptations of the devil. But yet I want to remind you that all of these things in and of themselves Though they be good, they are less than helpful unless you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's how we gain the person and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit who gives us that energy, so to speak. He's the engine of our life. And unless you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you really can't even fire on four of the eight cylinders because you don't have an engine at all. And, and you might have the prettiest life, prettiest automobile that you might can have on this face of this earth. But without Jesus Christ, you just have a shiny instrument, a paperweight, a doorstop. And so I want to implore you today, if you've never admitted that you're a sinner before God, that you've never prayed to ask a God Almighty to save you in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who was foretold that would come to pay the debt penalty of sin by being crucified, laid in the tomb three days, and raised according to the scriptures. If you've never made a profession of faith in him that you said, I'm going to trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sin. I'm going to trust and follow him all the days of my life that you do that here today and that you not be ashamed of that 
that you would confess that before a church. You would come to a church family now that you would be a child of God, that you would see the value of being in the family, in the community of like-minded believers, and that you would humbly begin that, uh, that, that trek of spiritual maturity until you're taken home uh, with a church family that you, you would align yourself to the Word of God rather than trying to align the Word of God to your life and wherever it might fit, but that you would grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter's Word, and that you would become a willing participant in spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ wherever you might be. Because the world is full of need of cures, but the greatest cure that this world has need of is a cure of our condition as human beings when we're brought to biological life here. We've been separated by sin from Almighty God, our Creator, and that's what we get at the cross of Jesus Christ through His shed blood. As we get absolution from sin, and we get restoration into a relationship with our Creator. And so if you're willing to do that today, whether you're there in the pew, out in the internet somewhere, or or you can come to this altar. You can do that right now just by praying with these words. If you would, if you would uh, pray with me right now, someone out there, please, pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died for my sins. I, 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 I know that you were raised. I believe in my heart that you were raised on the third day, just as the Scripture said, and that right now uh, you, sit, you are seated in heaven, Lord, interceding for me, that, that I would believe, that I would trust you in you, that your shed blood would cleanse me from all of my sins, Lord, and make me a child of the Most High God, and that you would be exalted, and that I would follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I'm not ashamed of you, and I want to unite with fellow like-minded believers in, a, in, a, in an association called a biological organism called a church. Lord, where I will be able to grow and learn more about you. Lord, I, I thank you today for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.